Hello and welcome to the first lecture for Unit 1. This unit is focusing on how we, how the Americans form their new identity separate from England and how that kind of drives a wedge in between the colonies in England and how we eventually get to revolution. So we are going to be wanting to think about these two things. What were some of the changes in America brought on by the Great Awakening? And, you know, summarizing the Enlightenment and how they affect the col how it affected the um, colonies. And then we're going to be looking at a second part to these learning targets later on. So, settlers in the New World faced new climates and new living conditions. That means that the way that they live in America is completely different than the way that they live in Europe. And as colonists adapt their old ways to a new world, this new American identity is formed, this new kind of way of living. The, in England, less than 5% of the population own land. That is only 5%. That is not very many at all. On the other hand, in America, land was plentiful. And because, you know, as we saw with the backcountry and the settlers who, was, who were forced to move out there and not have any good land, um, any sort of land ownership gives the colonists political rights. Owning good land might give you more rights, or even owning more land might give you more rights, but owning land gets you political rights. Widespread land ownership gave all those people political rights and develops a new class system. Instead of having kings and lords and all this kind of stuff, America had no class of nobles whose titles were passed from parent to child. So you don't have like a duke of whatever, and then his son is also the duke of whatever just because he's the son. You earn a title in America because you earned it. Um, you have a title because you earned it. Uh, you also have a large middle class in America and a very large slave underclass. So those are things that you need to be thinking about in America as opposed to in Europe. The colonies had a high rate of literacy or the ability to read and because they can read that means they can share ideas quickly children were taught to read so they could read the Bible. Um, that's the main reason for learning to read for a lot of these children in the early parts of the um, colonial times. Education varied from there according to region. Literacy helped to connect the colonies. Newspapers become very popular so if you know liter without literacy you know you can't really read newspapers and without newspapers you cannot really um, share and spread ideas and eventually we're going to be spreading the ideas of revolution and breaking away from England so without literacy and without newspapers you don't spread those ideas as easily some colonies publish books um, or some colonists publish books Benjamin Franklin published Poor Workers Poor Richard's Almanac. Two cultural movements helped shape the new society in America. These are the Great Awakening and the Enlightenment. The Great Awakening is a religious movement that swept through the colonies in the 1730s and 1740s. The Great Awakening is all about um, traveling ministers preaching that each person could break free of the past so you can break free of the past and begin a new relationship with God. So you leave the past behind and you start a completely new life or relationship or you get a fresh start. Um, before this, the Puritans kind of preached, you know, if you, if you mess up, you are basically done and that's it. But now people start to think, oh, well, you know, maybe we can leave the past behind. Maybe we don't have to do what we did in the past. Maybe we don't have to follow that anymore. This movement leads to a lot of social change. The Great Awakening encouraged colonists to challenge tradition and authority. So this allows it, this allows the colonists to, it's easier for them to challenge political traditions like having a king. Maybe they 
challenge this tradition. Why do we have this king? Why do we why do we do this? It's not we don't have to do it just because we've always done it in the past. This lays the foundation for revolt against British authority, and that is what we will see later on in this unit. The Enlightenment is the second movement. It emphasized human reason and science as the path to knowledge. So the Enlightenment calls for equality, social and political changes. So what you're looking at is, you know, instead of just saying, oh, the king is the king because his dad was the king. Well, that doesn't really make much sense because the king has a lot of power. So don't you think that the person that has all of that power should be the person that is best qualified? So let's go through a scientific process or a method in order to find the best person. Let's vote. Let's, you know, give them, you know, let's base it off of what they can do, not just who they were who their father is. Some people like the philosopher John Locke challenges the belief that the king just has a God-given right to rule. Just because you're the king, just because you the you were born under, you know, your father doesn't mean that you get to rule doesn't mean that God told you you can rule um, and maybe the best person for the job wasn't born with a good last name maybe they might be a poor person a lower class person maybe they could do a better job he also argued that people have natural rights to life liberty and property um, we will see the this phrase kind of pop up later on so life liberty and property so he's saying that when you are born, you have the right to live, you have the right to, you know, have some sort of freedom and liberty, and you have the right to a, a chance to own some property. Because, you know, as we talked about earlier in this lecture, in order to have those political rights, you need to have some sort of ownership of land and things like that. So that's what John Locke is saying. John Locke said that people had the right to change the government if it did not protect those rights. This idea becomes very influential in the colonies. So if the king isn't protecting your right to own property or isn't protecting your right to live, you should be able to get rid of that king. The colonists were beginning to see that the British might be a threat to those natural rights and those freedoms. And this is, you know, the th the, the British are a threat to the freedoms. That's a lot of why you know they rebel in the first place. So in the second part, we're looking at what issues created conflicts between England and the colonies over colonist rights. The colonists shares a colonist living in the colonies lit seems that. The colonists living in the colonies share the same rights as people living in England. The English had been developing these rights for centuries. The Magna Carta is the first thing that they set up that allows them to have some sort of say and not just have the king tell them what to do all the time. It limits the king's power. Property could not be seized from them for no reason and taxes could not be passed without the king couldn't just pass taxes without asking people, without having council consent. Parliament is England's lawmaking body this is another way what, where they this is another way how they uh, strengthen their rights because the parliament is like a representative form of government the colonists use this as a model when they set up the house of burgesses you know we elect people and then those people go and vote in one central location for all of us they represent us parliament has two houses the house of commons and the house of lords the house of commons is people that are elected by the people and the house of lords is a house that you know you or your dad was a duke so you get to be a duke um because the king and parliament were so far away some self-government was allowed the relationship between parliament and smaller colonial assemblies was not very good because parliament passed laws without asking for input from the colonies so what you will see is parliament just deciding oh that this is what's going to happen you're going to have to follow this law or this tax and pay a whole bunch of money but in reality you know it doesn't serve your best interest but they don't care because they don't have you don't have any representation in parliament the colonists don't have any representation over in england they just get to decide what is best for everybody, even though it might not be in the best interest of everybody. Um, this is kind of like a situation where if we were going to pass some sort of tax 
on school lunches and every classroom got to go up to the office and send their representative to say who's gonna have to pay this tax seventh or eighth graders now in a fair situation we have eighth graders eighth graders would get to vote and seventh graders would get to vote and then you know whoever wins wins um, and that grade would not have to pay the tax but in this situation what you see is a kind of if the seventh graders were the only ones that get to vote now the seventh graders are not going to vote in the best interest of the eighth graders they are just going to vote in the best interest of themselves so in this situation the eighth graders would be like the colonists and the seventh graders would be like parliament and there's no representation of the eighth grade vote in the seventh grade vote you just have to listen to what the seventh graders say and listen to what parliament says king james the second started to restrict rights not only in the colonies but also in england and you know by restricting rights that means that the people are going to be happy and that means the people are going to be happy at parliament in england so parliament offers to kick james out and offer the throne to his daughter mary and her husband william with little support he, james kind of looks around and says if i stick around here i'm going to die so he leaves this change in power is known as the glorious revolution so this change in power from the strict king james to the more lenient william and mary um is called, known as the glorious revolution and the english bill of rights is re-established by William and Mary. It's a list of specific rights of English people. They could not tax without approval. Like the king can't just make a tax without some sort of approval. There are free elections and meetings. So everybody, you know, most everybody gets to vote and everybody gets to come together to talk about whatever they want to talk about. And people could complain. The colonists had their rights restored because of this glorious revolution they can again elect represent representatives and ex they they had to accept a governor appointed by the crown so the king and queen get to decide you know oh you have to listen to this guy because he's going to be the governor during the early 1700s the english did not really interfere with colonial affairs that much this is called salutary neglect salutary neglect the word neglect means to you know leave alone now, not all neglect is bad. Now, if you are walking in the forest and you see a bear and you neglect it, like you don't pay attention to it, you go the other way, you leave it alone, that's good neglect because that way you're not going to get eaten by a bear. But if you neglect you know, a, a dog that you have and you don't feed it or you don't take care of it, that dog's probably going to die. That is bad neglect. Salutary neglect is beneficial, so it's good neglect. So, you know, salutary means good. So it's good neglect or beneficial neglect. The colonists get used to acting independently. Basically, it's like a situation where, you know, if your parents say you could stay out as late as you want, every night, do whatever you want, go wherever you want, it doesn't matter to us. And they do that for a whole year. So you would get used to acting independently, coming in at 5 o'clock in the morning, staying out until whenever, you know, doing whatever you want. And then let's say a year goes by, and all of a sudden they decide, okay, not going to do this anymore. You have to be in bed by 6 p.m. You would get used to this independence, and then you would get pretty mad that you had to stop doing that. So that would cause a little conflict between you and your parents. And that's what's going to happen here in a little while. Um... Zinger and freedom of press. Uh, in 1735, colonists moved closer to gaining a new right, which was the freedom of press. John Peter Zinger stood trial for printing criticisms of New York's governor. So he is printing criticisms, but he's saying all true things. Um, like that he's taking bribes and he's a bad man. And he's corrupt. Andrew Hamilton defends Zinger, saying that just because he's saying bad things about the governor doesn't mean he can be thrown in jail. If he's speaking the truth, it's okay. Zinger wins, and freedom of the press became an important right in America. So, what we're seeing is, throughout this, the colonists are growing more and more angry with the um, English, and we're going to see how that 
grows and grows after our next lecture, which is the French and Indian War.